morning. This is Marvin Glotfelty with another NGWA Industry Connected video. As you may know, a hydrogeologist and licensed well driller here in Arizona. Um, I want to talk about well development, some of the concepts and the principles and the things we need to concern ourselves with. Um, very critical, of course, with, uh, you know, to the performance of a well, both immediately after it's been constructed and really for the ensuing years. I've got a couple of diagrams here I would like to share. And um, so we need to consider what kind of well screen we're developing through. Uh, of course, on the upper row here, we have wire wrap. We have louvered. These, of course, just cartoons, but they give you the concept. Mills knife cuts vertical or horizontal mill slots. These would be more common in a uh, maybe a domestic well or an environmental well with PVC casing. You might see horizontal slots a little more commonly. Torch cuts uh, in some wells as well. Now these all have different um, apertures. The wire wrap is the one with most of the open area. There's uh, maybe around 20%, could be even greater percent open area here. So there's a lot of energy that can be directly conveyed through that. The rest of these are between 1% and 3.5% open area. So you're dropping off to a great extent here. And yet these are common and we want to develop these. So how's that going to happen? Um, as I've mentioned in some of the previous videos, the name of the game here is not just to uh, swish fluids back and forth and try to make the sand in the filter pack roll around. It's to get behind that filter pack. There's a borehole face here with a wall cake on it. We want to break that down. We want to remove it. And so how we convey that energy is going to really be critical to the success of our well development. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about these different kind of well screens, but whatever you're developing, there should not be a one size fits all because these different types of well screens are going to need quite a bit of a different approach. And here's some pictures of them. Torch cut on the left, vertical mill slot on the top, wire wrap on the bottom, and then on the right hand side you see the louvered screen. So just to kind of connect the dots there with what we're talking about. So again, when we do well development, uh, there's been lots of discussion over the years of what kind of well screen we have, what grain size of filter pack and such. The ability to convey water of the well screen is much higher than the filter pack because there's less friction losses and things. The filter pack, because it was in place well coarser and, and well sorted and well rounded, it's going to have a better ability to convey water than the native formation. And if we can get this well, to move water as well as the formation itself, we will have a 100% efficient well. That's as good as we're ever going to get. So what's the bottleneck? What's going to stop it? It's this brown line right here. That's the wall cake. Every type of drilling, there's no such thing as a way to drill a well without having some amount of wall cake. And that's because when we drill that hole in the ground, we have to get the cuttings out. That means we have to apply some positive pressure if, if it's a a uh, friable or alluvial formation, then it's liable to cave in on us. So we have to hold it open. And these activities cause this wall cake. And that wall cake makes the groundwater impeded in its flow. So the amount that's flowing to the well won't make it in. And so that the name of the game is to get rid of that wall cake so that we can get the full flow of the well. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. There's no single way, and I keep saying that, but it's important to absorb that because we see over and over again people force fitting an approach that has worked uh, maybe on a well down the road, but because the geology is different, because the well design is different, it may not be the right approach for this case. So um, here's some of the, uh, the methods. This is not complete, but it's quite a few of the common ones. I'll go through them. Dry swab. This is what we see oftentimes with cable tool. A single rubber swab reciprocated up and down the well. And that's a real good method, actually, especially with cable tool. Cable tools are completely set up 
to oscillate a tool up and down. That's what they do, you know, with, because they have the big walking beam and they're set up and they can just oscillate forevermore. They're not heating up brakes or things like that, that rotary rigs do have the challenge of doing. So with a single swab, we're doing a good job. And what I like about that is that it's depth specific. Any swabbing activity, we're looking at a single depth in a well so we can focus our development on that localized wall cake and break it down one at a time, um, usually from the bottom up, sometimes from the top down. But, but that's a, so that's a good approach. Uh, and then periodically, the dry swabbing, of course, does not remove some of the stuff that's been brought in. So you would just remove that periodically with either airlifting or bailing. Swabbing and airlifting is similar, except for that's usually with a uh, rotary or reverse circulation rig where we have two rubber swabs, one above the other, um, and then airlifting with perforated pipe in between them so that when we oscillate those up and down, we get double action, sometimes triple action. Some drillers like to have three rubber swabs. And then in between them, there's airlifting. So when something's broken free, it's removed. Um, a lot of uh, technical specifications, including mine in my early days, used to require a real big air package for this. Uh, I now think that's kind of unnecessary. The air package has to be adequate to remove whatever gets broken free, but the action, the development itself, is actually happening with the swab, not with the airlifting in this case. So the next one is airlifting alone. If we drill an air rotary well, then that's uh, we're getting some development action as we drill, but there's still a need to develop. We are keeping the borehole open. We're worried about getting the well constructed, so that's the the focus. And then once we uh, we finish the the drilling the bore, in this case we might have a a less extensive wall cake because we drilled with air and with some foam, so it's just a thin layer there. But still, there's the native material that we pulverized as we were drilling and we drove it with our force of our air compressor into the borehole, we need to remove that. So um, air lifting, we run our drill pipe down either with a bit on the end or else open ended and we just unload the hole. We, we, we blow air until the path of least resistance is to come up out the top and we blow a lot of material out and that's a very high energy way to develop and a good way to develop. But it's important to also think about the physics that are going on. If we have the drill pipe extending down to where my cursor is here, then the fluids are going to be blown upward and they're going to be pulling fluid in with them. But just below that bit, what's happening there? There's a lot of pressure outward. So we're compressing the, for, the fluids into the formation until they have no place else to go. So then they go up. So it's not like a vacuum cleaner and there is this localized area where we're not doing much good. So we just need to remember to progressively work our way up and down the hole so that eventually we remove all of the wall cake. And that uh, experienced drillers know that. And they, without even thinking about the physics, they know what to do and they get that done. So that's a, that's a good approach. Horizontal jetting um, makes more sense with wire wrap. Why is that? Because blowing a high velocity jetting tool against uh, you know, the 97% blank casing where you have 3% open area doesn't make much sense. And if you do it against louvers, we're hitting the face of those louvers. And so unless we point that jetting tool at a downward angle like this, then we're, we're not going to do as much good. But we're still doing good and it's done a lot. But there's some, there's some uh, disadvantages to horizontal jetting that's good to keep in mind. If we have a situation where we have extensive biofilm, we have biological fouling and, and bacteria and such, we may be driving that further into the formation if we're just pushing outward. Um, remember the jetting tool just pushes outward. It forces, it does a lot of uh, high energy in the filter pack here, but it's pushing outward. There's ways to do it simultaneously with either airlifting or pumping above it so that we get that high velocity just above it coming back in. But if we don't do that, if we just simply jet, then we have very high velocity out and just gravity flow back in above it. So that's going to be less uh, beneficial than if we do it with maybe a modified uh, approach here where we have a way to discharge our at a higher velocity the fluids that we're also injecting. <coughs> then we have over pumping 
Over pumping is where we're simply pumping the well at a higher discharge rate than it would normally be operated at. Now we've reversed this uh, one directional situation where we're, we're bringing in fluids very fast, but we're not pushing them back out. We really want to try to have this energy going both directions so that we uh, break up any sand bridges and have uh, complete well development. So this is a good approach. But again, there you may want to have uh, something that's sort of akin to this next option, pump and surge, also called raw hiding, where we pump real hard until we get a good drawdown with pumps clear. We have no foot valve on our pump and we just kick in the clutch and let this column of water surge itself back down into the well. With both pump and surge and over pumping, there is the advantage that we're moving a lot of fluid. We're moving a lot of water out of the bore and back in. There's also the disadvantage that it is looking, it is in com communication with the entire well screen, not locally, not depth specific. And so if we're making all our water in one interval, we're not really doing anything for the other. And if we can set that pump and we can pump and surge all day long, and we're not really getting to something else. So usually these two, over pumping or pump and surge, are done in conjunction with one of these others so that we do also get this depth specific uh, energy focused on these various steps. And all of these can be done in conjunction with chemical treatment. Lots of different kinds of chemical treatment. You know, we have chlorine, we have surfactants to break up clays and things like that. A lot of different chemicals. And so, um, they should be done in accordance with the supplier where they're swabbed into place or jetted into place, pushed out where they can really do that good, get them in contact with the wall cake that we're trying to break down and remove and let them do their job and then apply some more energy to remove the material. It works pretty well. So we have a lot of different approaches and and they're all uh, they're all appropriate for different situations. And so I, I, I don't advocate a particular one um, there's different ones that are favored in different areas because of their local geology, their local well design preferences and so on. And then we have monitoring. Uh, this is more on the left here. We see we start, you know, with dirtier water, it gets better, it gets better. Well, that's that's a good thing. But too often we just look at that and we say, OK, it's clear we're done. Well, are we done? Have we really developed the well? We should be looking at all this stuff very carefully and uh, so sand production is one. We use an Imhoff cone or a rosin sand tester and we can know how much sand we're producing. Um, specific capacity, the gallons per minute uh, compared to the feet of drawdown. That should improve and improve and improve. And once that gets stable, that's probably a better indicator than any of these others as to when our development is optimal. But uh, it's a little bit challenging to measure, especially if we're doing something like airlifting. How can we measure that flow? We have aerated water. How can we measure drawdown? We have all these tools moving up and down in the well. So it's not it's easy to say hard to do. So um, with the pump options here, we can do that with these other options a little bit more difficult. So um, that's something for us to keep in mind and do the best we can. But it's not so obviously easy unless we have an annular tubing string out here where we can measure water levels uh, even though we have development tools in our well. Turbidity is just the, the fine grained dirtiness of water. Um, and then these field parameters collectively generally called field parameters because they're easy to measure in the field. We always look at color, odor, pH, temperature and the electrical conductivity as an indication of salinity. So we can look at these things and, and get a feel for when we've developed the well adequately. So I wanted to show you just to, to, to bring home, you know, this is a coupon of louvered screen and, and you can see if you look into it, kind of see the, the edges where, where there's, there's uh, fluids could be moving through there just fine. But face on, if you had a jetting tool or something, you'd want to use something that would hydraulically send a pressure wave <coughs> through it, like swabbing or something like that. If you have a wire wrap screen here, now that's open. Now you can you can shoot jets right through there and no problem. So it really depends. Or you may have an old piece of well casing. This is actually um, this is actually what's called uh, um, 
pipe base or a rolled, it's rolled uh, casing that they punched it and then rolled it after the fact. Um, don't see it very often, but I've seen it in uh, wells in Arizona and California from time to time. Something like this, you've got mostly blank casing. You're only going to have a few open areas, and so you'd want to just consider what you're working with um, all the time. So with that, you know, there's there's no right answer, but you should be thinking about what you're doing. Um, don't uh, get too uh, committed to a preconceived notion of, of how much time and what method will develop. Uh, just do your best to uh, to do it on a well by well and case by case basis. Thank you very much.